else should be on. Uh, it's not very often that all of our musicians are gone the same week, but uh, I guess we'll blame that on the mothers. <laughs> uh, I, I would uh, like to m mention that for the ladies, there is a gift in the back as you leave. Uh, it's a two-part gift. On, on the front, it says uh, Mother's Day, but if you're not a mother, we still want you to have the gift. So just tear that, that part off and, and take the gift with you there. So uh, that, that'll be available in the back a, as you leave. I won't spoil it. My wife said, don't tell them what it is. So <laughs> I, I won't tell you what it is. But uh, b before we look at Philippians, I have to begin with a disclaimer today. I yeah uh, didn't realize it, but I almost got myself in trouble today. Uh, uh, if you appreciate the PowerPoint, tell my wife because she's the one that does that. I have nothing whatsoever to do with putting the PowerPoint together. Matter of fact, if I had to, you wouldn't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I think at the same time, you also need to thank uh, Andrew and his team because uh, my, my wife is able to take my notes and decipher them and, and, and get them up on the screen, but uh, they have to be able to follow the notes. And how they do that, I don't know. Ginger underlines it for them to make it easier, but. Uh, uh, People have said, well, can we have a copy of your notes? And I said, it won't do you any good. <laughs> because I leave things out, I put things in. It, it, but uh, when Ginger's doing the PowerPoint, a lot of times she'll come and she'll say, what does this mean? Or, or what do you mean by this? I'm trying to get a clarification. And, and uh, my smart aleck answer is, you have to come to, and find out. <laughs> But, but sometimes I have pity on her and I tell her what, where, the direction I, I'm going with this. But it was really bad last night. Uh, she was finishing it up and I heard, oh no. <laughs> I, I knew something was wrong. And, and uh, I, I walked over and on the first screen, she had put at the top of it, and that's not in my notes, so I'm not responsible for it. <laughs> but at the top of it, it said, Happy Mother's Day. And she said, look at the title of your message. <laughs> uh, I figured if we went with that, I would probably be in trouble. <laughs> uh, and so my disclaimer is, I am not giving a Mother's Day message this week, this time. I, I haven't done it yet here, and, and I probably never will. Uh, because as I said in the past, women in our church are probably the most overworked and underpaid people that we have. And they don't need Pastor Dan to tell them what to do. They, they, they don't need a special message from somebody that's not even a woman that, that understands where they're coming from. So I have chosen not to do a Mother's Day message. So loving a porcupine has nothing to do with, with mothers today. <laughs> So with that in mind, <laughs> let's take a look at Philippians before I get in any more trouble. Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I love to see, my joy and crown, so stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. My first experience with a porcupine was back in 1966. I'd gone as a missionary for the summer to Alaska, and uh, one day we had a break, and several of us decided to take a lake. We, we were out in a wilderness area, and we hiked around Victory Lake and we headed up a, a canyon, that, a, a creek that came into the lake there. And we came into this clearing and there was a porcupine in, in, in the clearing. And the first response of those that lived in that area was, let's kill it. 
And I went, why in the world would you want to kill a porcupine? I, I'd never been around them. Well, a few years later, well, they, they explained why, because they will eat a circle around the tree, uh, eat the bark off, and they kill the tree. And, and you have a, a whole lot of trees out there that were being killed by this little porcupine. Uh, I also found out a few years later, when we had got married, we had our a dog, uh, uh, Collie Shepherd mix, and one day she came home with porcupine quills, and we were able to pull them out, and then a little while later, found another porcupine, and we had to take her to the vet to get them out. So uh, I, I didn't have a lot of sympathy at that point for, for porcupines. But Chuck Swindoll, in his book, Laugh Again, tells the old forest folk tale of two porcupines that were huddled close together in the middle of the cold Canadian winter. They, the closer they got together to stay warm, the more their quills began to prick each other. And so they would silently move apart. They would start to get cold. They would move back together again, starting to prick one another, and move, they, would, they just continued that dance for, for a long time. Uh, their action was like a slow moving monotonous dance, back and forth, back and forth. And he goes on to say the two women in Philippi were a little bit like those porcupines. They needed each other, but they couldn't get along with each other. Uh, do you know someone who resembles a porcupine today? Somebody that maybe is difficult to get along with? Uh, read a, a Snoopy cartoon a while back. And in it, Lucy was talking to Snoopy. And in, in the first panel, it said, Snoopy, uh, sometimes you really bug me. In the next panel, it said, but I have to admit, sometimes you're, hu you're huggable. And in the third panel, Snoopy says, that's me, huggable and buggable. Uh, we begin with two women who were at odds with one another. They were, in a sense, huggable and buggable. And uh, the, the passage begins with that little word, therefore. So it, it takes us back to the previous chapter. When, whenever you see therefore, you've got to go back and find out why he's re referring to, to the past there. And in the previous chapter, he reminded us of where we came from. And then he reminded us of where we are headed. We're pilgrims. We're, we're strangers in this world. We're, we're headed home. We're, we're not home yet, but, but we're heading there. And so therefore, he calls us to unity. Uh, someone wrote, and I'm not sure who the author of this was, but it said, to live above with saints we love, that will be glory. To live below with saints we know, now that's a different story. And, and that's where, where the, the problem often comes in. As J. Vernon McGee used to say, that's where the rubber meets the road. Trying to live with one another when sometimes each of us can be huggable and we each can be buggable. And, and meshing those two together can, can be a, a real problem. And, and so as we look at this, how do we resolve those conflicts, the, those that come into our life because as we're going to see in, as we work through this passage, how we deal with them impacts our testimony in the community and our testimony to, to other people there. And so Paul begins in verse one by encouraging us to stand firm in the Lord. The uh, context comes out of chapter one. He started that, that thought in verse 27 where he, he said, whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit. So he was calling them to stand firm together. He, he gives the same idea in chapter 3, verse 18, where he, he, that's not quite the right verse there. Anyhow, he, he uh, oh, Join us in following my example, 17. Observe those who walk, for many walk of whom I often told you that 
they, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So if we're not standing firm, we can be enemies uh, of the cross of Christ. And we don't want that to affect our, our testimony to the community. But it, we need to remind ourselves that our enemy is not our brother or sister in Christ. We do have an enemy. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 speaks of the fact that um, we wrestle not, again, not with one another there, but rather with, uh, he said, finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wicked places. So that's where our battle is. Our battle is not with our brother or sister in Christ. How is it possible for us to stand firm? How is it possible for us to be united together? Uh, he, he gives us two reasons, I think, in verse one. Number one, he calls us to remember who we are. Remember who you are here. Paul uses that term, beloved brethren. Now, some of your translations simply puts it brethren because that it's one word in Greek and it, and it implies somebody who is a be beloved brother or sister in Christ. The term incidentally includes both men and women there. Well, what is he suggesting in that? He's suggesting that we are a family. We need to learn to get along together. Uh, a family that's divided is not a very pleasant family to be around. And so we, we need to learn to, to be able to get along with others. I like the old fable of the old man who had several sons that were constantly fighting and belittling one another and so forth. And one day he took them out and he asked each of them to bring a stick. And they brought a stick and he had each of them break their stick. And then he sent them out and got another stick and he put them together in a bundle. And he said, now break the bundle. And they couldn't do it. And his his message was they needed to learn to stand firm together. As long as they were divided, they could be easily broken. But when they were united together, they had the strength that they needed there. Ephesians chapter 4 emphasizes that. In verse 9, he says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. And how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. There is the reminder there that we need one another. We, we don't need to battle one another. We need to stand together with one another. Someone who thinks that they have no need for the family of God is somebody that's headed for trouble. Sooner or later, they're, they're going to, uh, and I've watched that happen, they, they withdraw from a church, don't get associated with another one. Pretty soon, they begin to lose their faith in the Lord and, and uh, begin to drift away from, from, from the faith there. Uh, we have that old chorus, uh, and I'm not gonna ask Chuck to make us sing it today. <laughs> uh, the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. And it's true. We are a family. If we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the implication is that our brother and sister has done the same thing. And so we need to learn to get along as a family today. So we, we begin by remembering who we are. Then we remember why we are here. Notice the next phrase there. He sa says, I long to see you, my joy and my crown. What is he suggesting in that? In 2 Timothy, yeah, do they, they move the books around in your book too? Or Thessalonians, I mean. <laughs> yeah. We're at the wrong direction. Somebody changed it in my book. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. It says, 
Um, for who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? He's using the same language there. Who is our joy? Who is our crown? It's those who have, through our ministry, come to know Jesus Christ. It, it, it's described there as, as the soul winner's crown that he promises to those that uh, seek to witness and share the gospel with, with others. And isn't that what we're supposed to do? Second, or First Corinthians chapter 3, 9 speaks to the fact that we are God's fellow workers. We are working together to reach the world with the gospel message. Now, we have different ministries in that. Uh, not everyone is gifted with the ability to go door to door and knock and, and try to share your faith with a total stranger. Some of you might like to do that. I don't know. I, I don't personally like to do that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, we, we each have a responsibility. We each have gifts to be used in the body of Christ. And so because of that, Paul said, you need to learn to stand firm together, to stand with one another. Uh, John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus said, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are what? They're white unto harvest. There's a harvest out there. There's individuals that, that need to be reached with the gospel message. Uh, Galatians chapter uh, chapter three, excuse me, chapter five, and this isn't in your notes, uh, verses 13 and following says, for you are called to freedom, brother, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. And the sad thing is that if we fight one another, that interpersonal conflict will hinder our testimony to the lost. We, we, we need to concentrate on getting together, standing firm together in the Lord. With that in mind, the second thing he shares with us is found in verse two, where he encourages us to settle our interpersonal conflicts. He mentions two women now. This is the only place in scripture where you will find these two women mentioned. How would you like to be remembered that way? <laughs> Two women that were at odds with, with one another. Did they ever work out their differences? We have no idea. You have to wait till you get to heaven to find that out. And uh, maybe when we get to heaven, the Lord will tell us that's really none of your business. I, but uh, here, here are, are two women that uh, are not getting along and they're hindering the testimony of the work there in Philippi. It, it's interesting the two names that are even here, Euodia, her name means fine travel or help on the road. Uh, I, I appreciate that. When we used to live out way out in the middle of nowhere up in Canada, uh, if you were traveling and you broke down, you didn't have a cell phone back in those days. Uh, the, even if you had a cell phone, the, most of those places there would be no service. And, and then to compound that, uh, you would go miles before you would find a ranch or another town and so forth. And you were on your own out there. So the, the custom was if you were driving along and there was a car off on the side of the road, you stopped to see if they needed help. Now, we don't do that so much anymore, do we? Because uh, we're closer to help and there's a lot of people out there that you can't trust if you stop. And, and so it, it's wise to, to, to use that caution. But out there in the middle of nowhere, you were expected to stop and offer whatever help you could. Uh, but evidently, she wasn't living up to her name. She wasn't being helpful. She, she was creating some problems there. Syntyche, her name means an accident or a chance meeting leading to a companionship. You ever have some of those? You, you meet somebody, maybe you get to visiting on an airplane or something and, and you just strike up a friendship. 
just a, a, a casual meeting, but suddenly you, you feel like you know one another and so forth. And uh, again, this wasn't happening with Syntyche. We don't know much about them. We don't even know what their differences were. Was it a, a theological issue that they were wrestling with? Was it an issue of control? Maybe they both wanted to be in charge of something and, and uh, they were arguing about who's gonna be number one. Uh, it may have been something more serious like the style of music. Well, it's not the kind I like. Or, or maybe even serious like uh, the color of the carpet. Uh, we, we can fight about all kinds of things, can't we? But uh, what does that do to our testimony? Paul uses a very strong word here when he, in verse 2 when he says, I urge you. And, and he's speaking to both of them here. Both of them had the responsibility to deal with the problem, to the, uh, the problems that had come up between them. Uh, back up to the color of the carpet and so forth. Uh, we need to choose our There are times when it is necessary. Uh, I realize I'm cutting out. Yeah, uh, I, I can hear that. <laughs> but there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, choose your battles carefully. I, I, is it really going to matter in eternity if your color didn't get chosen? No, not really. But we, 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 need to, we need to learn to live as much as possible in harmony. Now, in saying that, I am not suggesting that we will see eye to eye on every issue. Rather, we need to learn to disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, is that possible? Well, go back to chapter 2 for a minute. Notice in chapter 2, the admonition there beginning in verse 2, make my job complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, in, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. That would solve a lot of conflict, wouldn't it? If, if we would follow what he is encouraging us to, to follow in that particular passage. Uh, elsewhere in, in Romans 14, I won't take time to read that, verses 13 and 19 there. He, he's dealing with two issues that people were at odds with in the church of Rome. One was the issues of, of meat. What kind of meat could you eat? Uh, in, in those days, the, the cheapest meat was the meat that was being sold in the idol temples that had been offered to idols. And some people said it's wrong to eat it. Others said, hey, it, it's cheap. I, I can save some money this way. The, the other was the question of days. Uh, and uh, I, I've had come to me. Uh, I, they used to live, li leave literature on my church door in, in Shawana, saying that I couldn't be a Christian because I didn't worship on the Sabbath day, uh, or arguing about days and so forth. Paul said, you know what? Don't cause your brother to stumble. If they have a different, that's okay. That's, that's not your problem. That's how God has led that. Don't insist on, on your way at the expense of somebody else. In my, my first church, uh, I had an elder uh, saying this carefully. Uh, he considered himself an alcoholic. He hadn't had a, a drink in probably 15 years, but uh, he was, had been an alcoholic before he came to Christ, and he, he never lost sense of the fact that, that alcohol could get a hold on his life. And I asked him on one occasion if he was traveling uh, because of the distance and so forth, and he broke down in a small town, and the only phone was in the local bar, what would he do? And he said, with he said, I would walk to the next town. Now, you're talking 10 or 15 miles, but he would not go in to that bar because he was afraid that the temptation would be too great for him. You know, as I listened to him, I, that my first thought was, how foolish. Uh, uh, but then as I thought about it a little farther, I said, you know what? If I was with him, I'd walk to the next town because I wouldn't want to cause him to stumble. Uh, how serious are we about unity? 
what price are we willing to pay? How, how far are we willing to go so that others can see that the Church of Jesus Christ is united together? And then finally, the third thing he says here is to serve one another. He calls in verse three for two men or, or shouldn't say two men, two individuals to come and to help these two women uh, come together in, in their differences there. The one is not named. He, he calls him a comrade. The other he names as Clement. And again, we know nothing about this individual. Who was he? What, what was his position in the church? Uh, the, the fact is there were two women at odds with one another and he asked two people to step in and seek to bring peace be, between them now. Now that's a tough ministry. Jesus did say in Matthew chapter five, verse nine, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. It's not an easy, easy job or an easy ministry, but it's an essential one often in the church of Jesus Christ. In, in Galatians chapter six, he calls those that are spiritual to, to restore someone that's having a problem in these areas, uh, considering themselves lest they, they be tempted. It, it, uh, we, we've seen that ministry several times. I remember when I went back to Multnomah to, to work on my master's degree, our program that I was under, we had to work 30 hours a week in a local church. And being from coming from British Columbia down to Portland, I didn't have a clue what churches were there or what churches would be available. So I asked the director of, of the program if he would assign us to a church and he was willing to do that. And we went out to this church and, and we met with the pastor. He had gone through the same program that I was going through. So he was familiar with the requirements and so forth. And he shared with us that they had just gone that summer, they had gone from 120 people in the church to 60. And he said, we've worked through the problems, we've settled the issues, we're ready to move forward and we'd love to have you come and work with us. And I, I said, great, we're here for nine months. Uh, we're, we're more than happy to do that. We, we went, they asked us to join the church, we did. And the next Sunday he got up and he announced his resignation. And I found out that none of the problems had been resolved and uh, the uh, church board came and said, you know what, you're here as an intern pastor, why don't you take the job until we can find another pastor? And since I needed a job, it seemed like a, 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 the Lord was in this and I, I took the job. And uh, we wound up there, was, I think it was 18 months that we were actually there. But uh, I found out it was two factions in the church at odds with one another. I, I never did find out what the real reason was beyond the fact that each of them was headed by him. Each of them had a man in charge of their group that had been an elder, not at the same time, but at different times. And each of them wanted to be, I think, number one in, in the church. It took me from September till March working individually with these two men till I could finally get them to come into my office and sit down and for the first time in many months, talk to each other. You know, the sad thing about it wasn't what it was doing so much to them is that the, the church had lost its testimony in the community. And it was very difficult to get people to consider coming to that church as long as that battle was raging in the church. In Psalm 131 verse three, the psalmist said, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. Jesus summed it up for us in John 13, 34, where, where he says, by this shall all men know that you are disciples. How? By your arguments, by your fights. No, that's not quite what he said. He said, by your love one for another. And so we need to learn to, to deal with those interpersonal conflicts. The, uh, he, he mentions in verse three here, their names are in the book of life. Now, when we think about that, it doesn't mean as much to us as it would to the people in Philippi. In, in Philippi, because of their association with Rome and how they had helped Rome at one point in their history there, when uh, Julius Caesar was killed in deal with the uh, 
rebel forces, they were granted the right that anybody that was born in the city of Philippi automatically was a Roman citizen. The only requirement was that their names had to be recorded in the city records, and, and they would stay on those records until they died, and then they, the names could be taken out of the book. But, it, but as long as, as they were living and as long as their names were in the, that particular they were considered citizens of Rome. And that was a very prized possession in that day. Not very many places outside of Rome had that right to, to the automatic citizenship there. And, and so he's saying, you know what? You are citizens of heaven. Not of Rome now, but of heaven. Heaven is your home. We looked at that as, as we looked at verse uh, 20 last week of chapter 3. Our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. We are citizens of heaven, and the idea is we need to act like it. It's counterproductive when we allow little issues to divide us and, and to keep us from the testimony that God would have us give to the lost around us. So what lessons can we draw from this? I'm going to give you four quick lessons here that I, I, I draw out of this passage. One is conflicts will come. None of us are exempt from conflict. And if you, you may be at a time when you're not having one in your life, but I, I don't think if I asked for a show of hands, anybody could raise their hand and say, I've never been in a conflict. We, we, we've all been there. We, we, we all know what Paul is talking about when he, he deals with conflicts. And there are many reasons for that. We have different tastes. We have different ideas. We have different ways of, of doing things. Uh, we need to learn to approach life carefully. Don't get into an unnecessary battle over something that's, that's trivial or not worth fighting over. But as I say that, the second one that I have here is conflict is wrong. There are times when it's necessary to uh, get into a, a battle to, to fight, uh, especially when there's doctrinal differences. When somebody is scripture, we need to be able to step in and allow the differences to, to be dealt with there. But I think we need to make sure in our battles that it's a biblical issue. Not an issue that we think is, is biblical, but make sure you have a good biblical basis before you enter into a fight with a brother or, or sister there. And, and even when that happens, we need to make sure that we disagree without being disagreeable. I, I uh, have seen many of those battles over the years, I've seen individuals leave the church because things didn't go their way or, or the way they thought they should. Uh, and, and I've always asked, uh, do you try to get them back? I, I always tell them when they leave over doctrinal differences that uh, we're sad to see them go. Uh, if they ever need help, they're welcome back. But I don't beg them to come back. Because if God is leading them down a different path, that's between them and the Lord. Uh, I'm not going to compromise my principles just to bring somebody back and give them, give them their individual way. But in saying that, also, the third one here is conflict demands action. The tendency often is for us to ignore it and hope it goes away. Guess what? It doesn't usually go away. It's not that easy. Sometimes, uh, the fourth one here, conflict calls for a resolution. There, the, the goal of that, or excuse me, rec Reconciliation, not resolution number four. The goal of any action when we're in a conflict is not to get our own way. It's not to force the other person to see things our way. And it's not to punish the other person. The goal is that we are to seek, as we said from Galatians 6, to restore one another. We, we, we seek to, to bring that reconciliation. Now, I realize that's not always possible. H have you ever noticed how many does it take to tangle? 
It takes two. It also takes two to reconcile. And if one person isn't willing to reconcile, we can't change that sometimes. But we can make sure that it's not our problem. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, as much as lieth in you, be at peace with all men. And, and so make sure it's not our issue. Make sure it, it's their issue. We saw this at, in uh, our last church. We had a lady come forward that uh, wanted to take care of the flowers in, in the church. And um, we thought that, well, this is a great idea. So, somebody's going to change the flowers regularly and so forth. Uh, it's not an area that I have much interest in doing. Uh, if you had to have those decorations on there, it, you wouldn't have them <laughs> if it was up to Pastor Dan. But um, so we said, fine. Uh, she got a committee together and they were going to do the force. Next thing I know, she shows up in my office and she said, I need to talk to the board, uh, the elders and the deacons, because I want $3,000 this year to buy flowers for the church. Uh, you need to re remember we finished our second building program in about 10 years. So funds were not readily available. And we felt it was essential to bring funds into the ministry. Uh, Andrew, can I go to this mic? I, I, I realize that, but I don't want, I, every time it cuts out, everybody looks funny. <laughs> So I'll, I'll use this mic for, if, if that's all right. Um, no. Not all right? There we go. Okay, now I'm on. Uh, she came with a $3,000 budget for one year. And she wanted the next, for the same for the next year. And we had to tell her, sorry, we don't have three thousand dollars to put into plastic flowers there, there are a lot of plastic flowers in the church there were a lot of people in the church that had flowers that they could donate and use and so forth and it began a royal battle um, she asked her committee not to talk to the pastor because he wasn't supporting him and and it it, it, it almost split the church uh, I, I had, was in the process at the time of, of retiring, so uh, I was glad to walk away from it. But the, the uh, interim pastor that came had to deal with it, and eventually she had to leave the church. We found out in the process that she had done the same thing in at least three other churches. And uh, so there was no way she was willing to make peace. Matter of fact, even after I left and uh, we were living in the community. Uh, a couple of times I saw her when I was in the store. She would open the door of the store, see that I was in there, turn around and walk away. W wouldn't, wouldn't talk to us. Uh, and, and to this day, I haven't talked to her since. Uh, uh, I have prayed for her. Uh, I'm happy to reconcile. But uh, until she's willing, it will not happen there. So as, as you think about that, uh, make sure going on that it's not your problem, it's the other person's. As much as possible, he said, be at peace with one another. So are you in a conflict today? Do you need to resolve that conflict? Are you willing to take steps to go to your brother or sister, if that's what necessary, and, and see that that conflict can be resolved? Jesus said in... Um, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, he said, If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar. Go to your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. So you have a responsibility to go and to see if you can resolve the issues. In uh, 18 verse 15 he says um, if your brother sins go and reprove him in private if he listens to you you have won your brother if he doesn't listen to you you take one or two more with you so that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every fact will be confirmed 
And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church and, and so forth. So we have a responsibility as much as possible to settle conflicts amongst us. And the reason for that, I believe it's what Jesus said in John chapter 13. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, by your love one for another. Nothing hinders the church and nothing hinders the spread of the gospel more than conflict between brothers and sisters in Christ. So this becomes an important area. And as we move on into verse 4 next week, we're going to look at worry-free living. That's our, it should have had it this week uh, so that we don't associate porcupines with our, our mothers. But uh, it didn't work out that way, so we had a special speaker come in between. But uh, we're going to look at worry-free living next week. We need to settle those conflicts before we can have that worry-free living. We, we need to make sure that we're right with one another as much as possible. He said, be at peace with, with all men there because it affects your testimony and it reflects on Jesus Christ as well. So with that in mind, let, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've just been sung, singing about the wonderful grace of Jesus. It makes it possible for us to be right with you. It also makes us possible to be right with one another. So give us the courage. If there's a problem going on between us and a brother or sister, give us the courage to go and do whatever is possible on our part to get it right with, with one another, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.